Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. At this time, if anybody has a cell phone or anything else that makes noise, if you'd be so kind just to make sure that's turned to silent and or vibrate, if you will, please. Wow, it's a good group. Usually we hear all the music uh, going off on everybody's phones. For those of you I haven't met and for those of you who are watching us virtually, my name is DJ Wright, and on behalf of my family and our care team, our thoughts and prayers are with all of you uh, as we navigate this time of what can sometimes feel like darkness, but what I challenge you by the end of tonight to realize is really light. For those of you watching virtually, I know it's hard not to be here. The family knows. I've spoken to both the girls, and they know where time's different, you all would be here. So please know that every text message, every phone call, every email, it makes a difference. It really does. And I implore all of you here and all of you watching to remember that we got to go beyond our comfort zone, beyond what we think is normal, what we're used to during times like these. Because one day... We're all going to sit in this front row for somebody we love. And how would you want other people to react to you? So I don't challenge you because it's not a challenge, but I encourage you to do what your heart says. We're going to do a couple things tonight. I know John would be not happy that we were even doing this. It's too much. But I think he would say if my daughters need it, my grandkids need it, then go ahead, but keep it short, sweet, to the point. So for those of you who know me, and I'm sure the girls will chuckle, this is going to be short and sweet to the point, but for DJ, which means it's going to go on for a little bit anyway. But like a good mechanic, I think John will give me a sign and make me cut it short. We are going to have a time, though, for anybody here, if you wish to speak, we're going to give you that chance. As I told the family in the beginning, you can't say anything wrong. As long as you come from your heart, that's totally fine. But just wanted to give you a heads up now, uh, just in case that's something you want to do in a few moments. So even though John wasn't religious per se, in the sense that he would go to church and light a candle and do all that stuff, he was spiritual. He had faith. How can you not, after going through some of the things he went through? And we're going to talk about that in a moment. So if you came with somebody and you're corona-friendly with them, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, if you want to take their hand or put your arm around them. And let's just close our eyes in a moment of spiritual prayer as we begin. Spirit of life and death, thou who art as present to us in our suffering as in our well-being, abide with us now in this permeable time between the dusk and the dark. Soothe the secret pains we carry. Bless us with the courage to move towards our grief and not away from it. When all is hidden, when we find ourselves moving among the shadows, when we do not know the way, Spirit, quiet our hearts and still our restlessness. Help us to embrace the unknown, to hold the mystery and to let ourselves be held by it. Abide with us now, O Spirit of compassion, as the power of healing, the assurance of peace, the love that will not let us go. Amen. So I had a whole thing planned out for tonight. And then, of course, Big Mike, the rough, tough, burly mechanic, comes up with this sweet, sentimental, heartfelt love note. And I'm like, how am I going to follow that? So I'm going to diverge a little bit from where I was going to go in the beginning. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> You'll see behind me, for those of you who are watching virtually, I wanted to do something special because these two girls, their old man raised two heck, heck of a good quality daughters. So I wanted to do something special for them, and I, I made one of each of their weddings, and on one it says, 
Any man can be a father, but it takes someone special to be a dad. Pardon me, I'm not used to being stuck in a mic here for the virtual stuff. And that one says, Dads hold our hands for a little while, but hold our hearts forever. I've known the families for many, many years, but when they came to see me several years ago to plan for this day because they had to, and for those of you who ever have cared for a parent, you know that sometimes circumstances dictate you have to for legal obligations. And I remember the two of them distinctly sitting there, not wanting to be here, because they were both still daddy's little girls, even though they had become the mom. They told me of a man that you all know that had the humor of that guy that could tell a joke. A man that had the wisdom of somebody about four or five times his age. The man that had the ingenuity to figure out the most complex problems without making them more complex. The man who loved. The man who for whatever reason in his early 30s had a life-altering event. And I say that event tonight only because I don't want to focus on it. But the ladies have asked for donations to the organization, and I think it's wonderful. But as a result of that event, it only made that John who you all knew and loved come out even more. But in his early 30s, he had a heart attack. On the table, he threw a clot, which left him paralyzed, losing function of one entire side of his body. With two young girls and a whole life ahead of him, he could have done what most people would do, fall into a depression and go away. Not John. Was he happy? Of course not. But was he going to let it win? Of course not. He made sure his girls and his grandchildren knew that you should never give up. He didn't pine forever, woe is me, and, and sit there and blame the world. Let's move on. The doctors have used all the sockets they could. They used all the wrenches they could. They've got the new carburetor in. I'm good to go as best as I can be. She'll run. She may not win the Indy 500, but she'll run. And you know what? Starting up during the coldest weather with just one turn of the key is still okay. And that's who John was, is, and will be. He always started up. He never ever would give that mechanic a problem. John knew a long time ago that it didn't matter if you were a Bentley or a beater. I wouldn't say John was a beater, but he may say, and he did in a couple of times, that his body was a beater. But guess what? It got from point A to point B, and it did a damn good job of doing it. And that's what John taught his girls. It doesn't matter what you look like, who you marry, although he got two handsome son-in-laws, right? Damn right was their expression in case you didn't hear it on the camera. He would want the corny jokes right now. But John knew it didn't matter if you were black or white if you were gay or straight, if you were Catholic, Buddhist, or Hindu, as long as you tried, you loved, and you respected each other for whatever your station in life was, that's all that mattered. And when you have an illness that causes you to be different, 
different in a way where people sadly and sickly make jokes and assume certain things, it makes you see the world in a different place. And I have to say, I feel bad for all those poor saps at the pool hall who thought that this cripple guy is going to come in. Eh, all right, he wants to put a couple bucks down, let him. And then John would run the table on him with one hand. Never underestimate the lesson there, young grasshoppers in the second row. But I wanted to read a, a passage, and I've read this at the last three funerals, so if those of you who are watching virtually and you watch my funerals, uh, you'll know that I don't like to do a lot of the same things, but this is appropriate yet again. But it's appropriate for tonight because John knew the back and forth and how important what I'm about to read is. And you'll understand what I mean when I say back and forth. He understand and understood both sides. But it's a very famous passage. It was made famous by the Doors, probably a little bit around his era and uh, our era as well as gray hair, right, ladies? Oh, wait, you don't have gray hair. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 3. To everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. John knew that getting stuck in one was no good. And he'd be the first person, and I think he did tell both of you this over the years from my conversation from when I remember, that you will weep, but you better laugh again. That you will mourn, but you all better dance again. And it's hard right now when you're sitting at a funeral home looking at a casket of somebody who brought so much life and goodness into this world. We can't help but have heavy hearts thinking that that might be gone forever. But if you walk out of here, or you turn off your computers later thinking that that's gone forever, then we didn't do what John wanted us to do. We didn't do what these daughters who loved their father wanted their father's legacy to be. John would want you to dry your tears before you left everybody. He'd want the cheesiest grins underneath your masks as you walk forward tonight. He'd want you to go out and live and dance and do all the things that he would do where he's still physically here. And as I told the family when they first came, life has changed. It's not ended. It's ended if we let it. But why? Silly Americans, why would we let it end? John touched too many people in too many deep ways to let that just disappear because we're here at a funeral. But it takes everyone in this room to stop, to put the noise, and a lot of it is just noise, the noise of our busy lives aside, and time, time to stop and focus and let John come into our hearts and affect us in the way that we want him to. We don't pause enough in life. We rush through things. We're always out, you know, to the next email, the next text. The... We don't appreciate the moment. We don't appreciate the looking into somebody's eyes, which you'll hear about in a moment. No, I'm not gazing into your husband's eyes. He wrote about it. We rush through life. We don't appreciate sitting on the couch with a dog like you did a few minutes ago where you were sitting over there, sweetheart, and all, the, all your fears just went away. And you were just in that moment with Serene. Not that you forgot why you were here, but you knew it was okay. Little things like that are the big things. It's not the new Mercedes. It's not the 18 shore houses. 
I don't usually say this, but I'll say it tonight because I think John would be the first to say it. Folks, our graves are the same size. It doesn't matter. What matters right here. And look what they tried to do. They tried to damage the heart of this guy. Little did they know it was bigger and bolder and lasted many more years than anybody ever thought. I want to share Mike's words now. Now I know I'm not as handsome as he is. I don't have the sexy voice, but I'm going to try. And I give him a lot of credit because I had the privilege and honor to read this before privately. And you said it all, my friend. I can't cry, man. I'm going to start crying now. All right. But that's what it's about. We're all united as brothers and sisters in tears. Good evening. I'm Mike now. A taller. Good evening. On behalf of Annette, Stacy, and the rest of our family, I would like to thank everyone for attending this service, both in person and virtually. The outpouring of love and support has been overwhelming, and we are all so very grateful. Stacy and I started dating in January of 2006. Shortly after, I began meeting her family, her sister and brother-in-law first, then her father. One thing I remember most about John is when you would meet him and shake hands, he would always look you right in the eye. I always loved that about him. After meeting her family, I could tell right away that they were extremely close and that there was a lot of love. The relationship between the sisters was unmatched, and even more so between the girls and their dad. I remember meeting her father, and he cautiously greeted me like a protective father would to the man dating his daughter. I liked that, and I respected it. Years later, I went to visit him to ask for his daughter's hand in marriage, and of course, in typical John fashion, he said, quote, why are you asking me? Stacy's going to do what she wants to anyway. <laughs> we both had a laugh, had our cigarette, and a few years later, I became his son-in-law. They say that kids are a reflection of their parents. And I'd have to say John did a hell of a job raising his two girls. He would call Stacy or Annette almost every night just to check in, to see how everyone was doing, and chat just for a few moments. The love and care that Annette and Stacy have towards their children, you can clearly see they got from their father. A man that no matter how old his girls were, he always worried about them and their families. Of course, this past week has been rough. It always is when you lose a loved one. However, we should also be celebrating John's life. At the age of 32, John had a heart attack and a stroke, leaving him without the use of one side of his body. Doctors gave him only 20 years maximum, yet he kept on for almost 40. During those years, he saw both his daughters grow up, becoming respectable young women. He walked them both down the aisle and eventually watched them have children and families of their own. He got to see his grandkids go, grow up, one of them graduate from high school. He had an opportunity to live, to laugh, to love with his family until God called him up. The entire time, never feeling sorry for himself, never harboring any self-pity, never feeling defeated or allowing his handicap to get the best of him. He lived his life the way he wanted and was never afraid to say what was on his mind. A lot of heads are shaking on that one. We should also feel blessed that he did not pass alone in that hospital room, but had his daughter and son-in-law by his side. Granted, he probably would have told us to stop crying and get the hell out of there, but that's besides the point. Annette and Stacy had the opportunity to say goodbye to their father while he was still with us. And even though he may not have been awake, I have faith he heard his girls talking to him. We're also blessed that we got to spend time with him over Christmas, that he was able to leave JFK and visit his family for the holidays, have home-cooked meals that Stacy made, and in the morning have my famous bacon and eggs with coffee. It was the little things that he appreciated so much. I'm going to read that again. It was the little things that he appreciated so much. 
I remember the last days he was at our house. We were watching the Mecham Auto auction on TV and jealous of the guys buying those beautiful cars. Just him and I sitting on the couch, two gearheads enjoying a show. He was so happy to be out of that place for the weekend, and we were happy to have him, both not knowing it would be for the last time. I believe that people come into your life for a reason. And whether they are with you for a moment or your whole life, you always take something from them, a life lesson, if you will, be it good or bad. Well, the lesson John taught me was, it's never over. Keep fighting no matter what obstacles may come your way. Live the life you want. Don't let people tell you that you can't do something. Family always comes first. The next one's my favorite. Don't eat the Indian food at JFK Hartwick. <laughs> and yes, if you only have the use of one arm, you can beat your son-in-laws in a game of pool. <laughs> I'm not sure how to end this. I'm not sure what else to say, except I'm going to miss you, John. But I'll see you again. I'll see you at our breakfast table. I'll see you outside having your smoke, playing pool over at Aunt Kim's and Uncle Mike's. And I'll see you again when God decides it's my time. Thank you for everything, for raising two great daughters, and showing Randy and I how to be the caring, concerned, fathers that you always were to your girls. I love you, buddy. Until we meet again, my friend. Love, Mike. Now you can see why I didn't want to follow that. Thank you, Mike, for those heartfelt words. You could tell the inspiration that your father, you notice I didn't say father-in-law. That was dropped a long time ago for the two of you. That your father made on you. The little things are the most important. Thank you. Again, now I know it's hard. It's going to be hard to follow that one. But if there's anybody who wants to come share what's in their heart, please feel free. You can't say anything right or wrong. Just catch my eye. Come on up. You can take your mask off when you're up here and just introduce yourself so that everybody knows uh, who you are for the virtual folks. Is there anybody who'd like to come up? I know it's hard. Okay. I know there are a lot of John stories. For all of you watching virtually and for all of you here, I really would love for you to write them down. Not email, you heard me correct, a pen and a piece of paper. Write them down and get them to John's daughters. You can mark on the envelope if it's G or PG or PG-13 or it goes up the pipe. But these young grandkids, we want them to know more about their pop-pop. He already imparted a whole lot of wisdom on them. But I know that this family would love to hear more. So if you can, just think of some things. And when you get a chance and the spirit moves you, write them down. Drop them in the mail. Because that's the continuum of life. I wanted to share something Annette asked me to read. It's a very powerful poem. And I think knowing how she felt about her father, I know why she sent it to me. It's entitled, Remember Me. To the living, I'm gone. To the sorrowful, I'll never return. To the angry, I was cheated. But to the happy, I'm at peace. And to the faithful, I've never left. I cannot speak, but I can listen. I cannot be seen, but I can be heard. So as you stand upon the shore, gazing at a beautiful sea, remember me. As you look in awe at a mighty forest and its grand majesty, remember me. As you look upon a flower and admire its simplicity, remember me. 
Remember me in your hearts, your thoughts, your memories of the times we loved, the times we cried, the times we fought, the times we laughed. For if you always think of me, I will never be gone. Always remember me by Margaret Mead. John ain't going anywhere anytime soon. You know that. <laughs> From the wit of his grandchildren as I was meeting them and chatting with them before. Buckle up, ladies and gentlemen, in the front row. In a good way. I wanted to conclude our time with two readings. One, for those of you who don't know, John had some major medical issues New Year's Eve. He was rushed to the hospital, but this time, unfortunately, his body was tired. He knew his girls were set. He just had a wonderful holiday with his family and made so many memories. And although he didn't want to go, if it was his time, he knew it was okay. John died the way he lived. There's a part in the movie Act of Valor that was taken from the Indian chief Tecumseh. It was an old story about what the Indian chief told his troops, and most people know it from Act of Valor because they took it for the movie. And I can't help but think, as the girls visited their father, virtually and in person, talked to him, like he heard him, no he heard all of you guys, no question about that. I don't ever for a second doubt that. I've seen too much over 20 years to ever doubt that. But John died the way he lived. An inspiration and a hero. And so as you hear these words, I want you to think a little bit about John. About ways we can all live our own lives a little bit more like him. Because if we can die this way, it says a lot about who we are and who we always will be to those who love us. So live your life that the fear of death can never enter your heart. Trouble no one about their religion. Respect others in their view and demand that they respect yours. Love your life. Perfect your life. Beautify all things in your life. Seek to make your life long and its purpose in the service of your people. Prepare a noble death song for the day when you go over the great divide. Always give a word or a sign of salute when meeting or passing a friend, even a stranger, when in a lonely place. Show respect to all people, but grovel to no one. When you arise in the morning, give thanks for the food and for the joy of living. If you see no reason for giving thanks, the fault lies only in yourself. Abuse no one and no thing, for abuse turns the wise ones to fools and robs the spirit of its vision. And when it comes your time to die, be not like those whose hearts are filled with the fear of death, so that when their time comes, they weep and pray for a little more time to live their lives over again in a different way. Sing your death song and die like a hero going home. If that doesn't sum up who John is, see, that's my sign telling me I've gone too long. <laughs> John was, is, and will always be that hero, especially to the hearts of all who loved him so much. And as I said before, to honor him is to go back out into the world to put your spin on life, but to do it with a whole lot of John influence. I can't help but think the world might be a little bit better place. And with everything going on right now in this world, we need a whole lot more of what John brought and leaves with us to continue in his honor. I know how much Pop Pop loved his grandkids. We know about you two. You four, actually. 
But we also know how much he loved his grandkids. I want to read this poem for all of us to conclude our time together. But more importantly, as Pop Pop's final message to you in this space. He's got a lot more messages coming in all those notes that everybody's going to send. But for this time and space, I can't help but think this is what he would want you to hear, want you to remember, and more importantly, want to put into action. We can talk. Talk is cheap. Action is what means something. You probably read this because you graduated high school. You two will probably read it eventually. It's deep, but it's important. You've all probably heard it. You've probably heard uh, the last of the four stanzas, but I'm going to read all four of them. It's called Invictus by William Ernest Henley. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced, nor have I cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but my head is unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. And finally, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Annette and Stacy and their families, a very sincere thank you to all of you. Again, as I said in the beginning, for those of you who are just joining us, the outpouring, the tremendous outpouring of love and support, it means so much to them. For those of you who would like to say a little prayer for John tomorrow, at about 10.30, the cremation will be taking place privately. But if you want to just stop what you're doing at that time, play a special song, just stop what you're doing for a moment and remember John. That'll be the time that everything is taking place. In a moment... I'm going to move the kneeler and the lectern out of the way. And for those of you who are watching, that is going to be your opportunity to say your final prayer, if you will, for John and for all the people here. So I would encourage you to, were you here and were you coming up to the casket? What would you think? What would you say? What would you do? We want to give you that chance now. Then after a few moments, for all of you in the room, members of my care team will be coming by. If you wish to come forward one final time to the casket, you'll have an opportunity to do so. You're going to come forward row by row. I would ask that you remain in a state of reverent silence as you come forward into this room so that those who are left can have their private time. I would also ask as you leave the building, you just kind of stay quiet as well so that those who are left have that final time for contemplation and prayer. The immediate family, I'm going to ask you just to remain seated after everybody has come forward. We're just going to have a little chat and go over a few things about tonight and tomorrow and give you a final chance as well. Again, a very sincere thank you to all of you for coming. And I would ask that you just remain where you are for just a moment in silence as those who are with us virtually have a chance to pay their respects with John at the casket. Those of you who are coming forward in a moment, if you would like to 
kiss John, hug John, whatever you want to do, it is totally okay. Um, just obviously sanitize after you leave, just for your own safety, but it's totally acceptable. Uh, the girls know and are fine with it. When you're ready now, we'll have you come forward, please. senior facilities and they'll like they'll take the spray apart and have a life skills class which is kind of nice kind of, um, what we're going to do is we're going to have you all come forward oh we'll get all that so what's going to happen is did you guys decide tomorrow are you going to come or no? you are okay. i think i told you 10 o'clock so you're going to pull in tomorrow at 10 o'clock the hearse will be outside you're just going to get behind me we're going to drive down to the crematory obviously you can't get out there but what i do is i just have you pull up alongside after we get there, and you can just say your final prayer, and then you can kind of, kind of go from there, okay? I will give you everything back tomorrow. You have thank you cards, all the additional booklets, all the signs around the room, so don't worry about any of that. <coughs> we'll get everything for you, okay? And uh, obviously anything you need, just let us know. And uh, Mike, you're going to be my new writer. That was, no, I mean, I'm serious. He inspired that in you. Says it all. I mean, you Thanks for a truly great man. Not there, but I'm trying to <laughs> no, it was it was it was from the heart. So, but does anybody have any questions while I have you all here together right now? So there's no right or wrong way. We're gonna have brother, sister, brother-in-law, niece, and nephews around. You guys come forward, and then if you guys want to come forward with your kids, and then if you girls want to come, however you want to do it is is fine by us. Okay, just take your time, and then afterwards. We're just going to have you step in the other room, and before the two of you leave tonight, I do need a, a quick signature.
realize what they did. Well, obviously they learned from Pop Pop, but I don't always see that. And it's a pretty powerful lesson about life and about love. So I hope you guys take that with you, okay? I'm more like Pop Pop. This world really would be a better place. We'll step back out this way. If anybody wants to come back, we'll give you that chance, okay? Brazil will be by the door here. I was going to say, be careful. We were going to cut that out for you. Be careful. It's got a big spike on the bottom. Yeah. yeah. You want us to wrap? You want to take it home tonight? Because normally we bubble wrap it for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll bubble wrap it. Yeah. 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 say this is for the vampires. Yeah. <laughs> I pulled it out once. I was like, yeah. Take the other notes that you guys put in, and I'm going to tuck those all in by his heart, okay? So that's where they'll all be. So we'll step out, and if anybody wants to come back, like I said, by themselves, we'll let you do that. Huh?